Hi, everybody. Today we're going to be going through chapter 10. And chapter 10 has to do with microbial metabolism. Metabolism in general, I find to be completely fascinating as well as a lot of, I mean, it's the coolest, okay? That's really much what it boils down to. Um, <laughs> if you haven't learned about like aerobic respiration yet in um, physiology, then I am so glad to be uh, introducing you to that concept today because I think it is just about as cool as it gets. So let's get to it. These are learning outcomes as per usual for those who are interested. All right, metabolism refers to all chemical reactions inside of a cell. Um, there, you can basically divide it into two parts, anabolism and catabolism. Anabolism is making molecules, whereas catabolism will be breaking things down. I always think of cats and how they tear things apart. Um, so catabolism to me is breaking things down and that leaves anabolism as you know, building um, structures and larger molecules and such. Requires energy, whereas catabolism makes energy and that can drive anabolism. So um, that's overall, in general, those concepts are the accomplishments of metabolism for the whole cell. Um, anytime that we are um, going to be using um, energy, we are going to be using it in the form of ATP. And when it is used, we often release that um, that into the form of uh, heat and lose it in the form of heat. As we know about um, the second law of thermodynamics that, you know, that's energy, um, you know, is going to tend towards that um, more, uh, you know, disordered kind of state, entropy type of the state. Um, and, you know, first law of thermodynamics, that, you know, we're not going to be able to create or destroy energy. So it has to go somewhere. In this case, we're converting it into a different form. So a more, um, you know, disordered type of a form, less bonds involved and everything like that, right? So that's uh, going to be following both of those, first and second law of thermodynamics. Cool. So moving on. So catalysts, these guys speed up the rate of chemical reaction without being used themselves. Anytime that there is some sort of chemical reaction happening, a lot of times you have to have um, like a sort of energy hump that you have to get over a certain amount of energy that has to be put into a situation in order for that reaction to be able to be completed. And in this case, anything that's going to um, over help overcome that hump is going to be called a catalyst and enzymes or are, are organic versions of catalysts essentially that work for the, um, the cell in uh, various reactions to help uh, overcome activation energy within the cell itself during breaking apart or building molecules. Um, a lot of these are proteins and they often need cofactors, which is other parts that they have to have attached to them in order for them to function properly. Um, whether that is like iron or um, helping out the protein function or even um, other, you know, zinc or other molecules that it could be, um, or it could even be uh, organic cofactors like a vitamin or something like that. A lot of times um, enzymes that are working in the cell often need those as cofactors to help um, or as coenzymes even to help along with those processes. So um, each and just like any other protein, they're going to have their own unique shape and therefore their own unique function that corresponds with that. Um, they said that, that way the enzymes are allowing the reactions to happen at the speed of life, as we would say. So, um, we need the things made at a certain speed in order to maintain life at the speed that we live at. And so enzymes are the ones that are going to make that all possible, help speed up reactions to a point that we're able to live life the way we do. Um, for um, also looking at these guys, the enzymes themselves are always going to be larger than the substrates, of course, because they're going to have to have a little pocket for the substrate to sit into. And that substrate is the part that the um, enzyme is actually acting on that's going to be changed uh, due to the reaction that's happening. So that's our substrate. Um, and they're not going to be part of the substrate. They won't be made into part of the substrate and they will not be permanently changed at any point in that reaction that will be happening. Um, they themselves, since they are proteins, protein shape has a lot to do with interactions between um, molecules and a lot of times um, hydrogen bonds that are associating with one another. And uh, that can be greatly affected by temperature and pH. So they can be very sensitive to those types of things and break down the functionality of the enzymes when exposed. So enzymes react on to substrates. Um, yeah. 
I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I just said it earlier. So they're going to take their little substrate into the enzyme and um, uh, they will participate in the actual um, changing of the substrate, even though, like we said, they won't be permanently changed. Um, they will change maybe temporarily and then they can revert back to their original form after they're done acting on that substrate. Most enzymes are usually proteins. Um, a simple enzyme is something that's just that protein by itself, whereas a conjugated enzyme is going to be referring to um, a protein with some other molecule. So it could be protein even, and it says a conjugated enzyme is protein and some other non-protein, but sometimes our, um, those molecules will be still organic, even though they're not proteins. Um, the whole enzyme that is able to function, um, so, these, so this is referring to those conjugated enzymes that I was just talking about, sorry. So um, they have the main part that is the protein, and then they have the maybe organic molecule that um, interacts or the in inorganic molecule. Anyways, the whole thing that is functional is called the holoenzyme. The protein portion is the apoenzyme, and the cofactor is um, usually going to be the part that is going to um, be the non-protein portion that helps the enzyme function or is required for the enzyme to function. So these can be organic molecules, which in that case, we call them coenzymes. And that can include like vitamins and such like that. And then we have the inorganic or um, molecules that can be involved, such as metal ions um, that can be involved in the functionality of that protein as well. So the um, um, apoenzyme, the actual protein portion of that, um, that's where the actual um, active site where we're going to interact with the substrate will be is on that portion. Um, and it's usually a three-dimensional group. It almost fits like a lock and key interaction with uh, molecules on the substrate as, as well as uh, molecules on the um, active site um, uh, interacting with one another, maybe through hydrogen bonds or maybe through attractive forces or whatever it is. So um, this is just showing us uh, the level of protein structure to remind us of how proteins can be shaped and how important their shape is as far as their function goes. So here we have the enzyme in purple and we have um, substrates and other molecules that could be in the environment and only the substrate will fit. And then when it does fit into that active site for that enzyme, um, then it can perform its action. You know, it could be bringing, um, making bonds or it could be breaking bonds, right? Um, yes, and this here it's reminding us that this can take place quickly up to millions of times per second, millions of times per second. I do want to say that and we draw it out all nice and, and easy like this, like one, two and three. But in actuality, this is just so fast you wouldn't even know. So um, metallic ions are uh, sometimes going to serve as cofactors that help our enzymes function. So this often includes iron, copper, magnesium, manganese, zinc, cobalt, selenium, and there's others as well. Uh, so they're basically going to um, be participating directly in the chemical reactions involved in working on the substrate, whatever change that substrate is going through. So coenzymes, uh, th these are those organic molecules. Um, usually those organic molecules can be like vitamins that those, those can be components of the coenzymes. Um, sometimes they transfer hydrogen atoms or electrons um, and they can remove whole groups from chemicals and add it to another substrate, for example. There's six classes of enzymes overall. We have the oxidoreductases, the transferases, the hydrolases, the lyases, the isomerases, and the ligases. Um, if you didn't already know about DNA ligase and how it reforms those phosphodiester bonds between nucleotides to seal, you know, um, pieces of DNA together, that we've talked about it a million times, that hopefully you have learned about it by now. So, anyways, that ligase. That is an enzyme that um, catalyzes the formation of bonds. We have to, of course, put in energy in the form of ATP if we're going to be doing that because we're building um, a bigger molecule. So energy has to go in. Um, and then we can remove water as a product um, when we are making those bonds happen. So that's a ligase. Oxidoreductases, we're talking about exchanging um, electrons from one molecule to another. We have transferases to transfer functional groups. We have hydrolases that cleave molecules when you add water. 
Then we have lyases involved in double bonding, removing double bonds. And then we have uh, isomerases that change um, the shapes of the form of some molecules into other forms. Okay, other shape, um, like D and L um, amino acids, like being involved in changing those from D to L or L to D shapes. Okay. Oxidal reductases. Oxidation is loss of electrons um, and reduction is gain of electrons. So here's how I remember this. You do have to know this, by the way, and you will have to put this into practice. So this is, um, I remember it as Leo says, grr. That's how I remember it. There's other things that you can use. It could be oil rig. That was one that they had um, in the old book, oil rig. So the way that these work, um, lose electrons, you are oxidized. Did you gain electrons? Then you are reduced. That's how I remember that one. Leo says grr, Leo the lion says grr. And then oil rig is just a simple, you know, um, another play on that. Oxidized is loss of electrons. Um, reduction is gain of electrons. So that's how those might work. If there's one that works better for you, please use whatever works for you. You're not going to get tested on which one is right or wrong or anything. Just use what works. Okay, so oxidation is loss of electrons. A compound that loses its electrons is referred to as oxidized. Um, reduction is gain of electrons. A compound that gained those electrons is referred to as having been reduced. So these are important terms because we're going to talk about these a lot throughout the whole semester. <laughs> so we'll talk about, um, you know, oxidation and reduction as we go through all this. But remember, this is going to be exchange of electrons and um, loss or gain um, from one molecule or another. Uh, important um, uh, coenzyme Electron carriers are going to be NAD and FAD. We're going to talk about those in a moment. Constitutive enzymes are types of enzymes that are always present and um, in relatively constant amounts. No matter, there's no signal or anything that's going to make them, you know, be made more or less. They're just always there. Regulated enzymes, these the production of these guys will be turned on or off, induced or repressed, respectively in response to concentrations of substrate. This is sort of like the operons that we talk about with bacteria, but these can be regulated in um, not just bacteria, but um, eukaryotes in a similar fashion as well. So when we have constitutive enzymes, we just always have all of these little uh, blue hat guys, constitutive enzymes. We have blue hat guys in here interacting with our um, red substrate. And even if we add more red substrate, there's still the same amount of blue hat guys. However, in a regulated enzyme, we have a purple hat guy and yellow substrate. Okay, so if we add more of the yellow in, then in response, the cell will make more purple guy, purple hat guy. Okay, so more of that enzyme is being made, or if we had a whole bunch of purple hat guys, now we have a whole bunch of purple hat guys. Maybe now we um, have acted on our substrate and there's no more substrate left, right? Then um, this is going to cause this purple hat guy situation to um, uh, decrease. We don't need to make it anymore. So we'll let those guys, you know, um, dissolve out, be broken down by the cell or whatever it is that they're going to do. So the enzyme will be repressed and we we'll no longer make it anymore when in the um, situation where we have um, less substrate available. Okay. Microbial enzymes and disease. So, so some of these enzymes can be released by bacteria and cause damage, like by breaking down our own cells, for example. And those we would consider to be toxins. They have a negative effect on our body. Um, whenever they are secreting exoenzymes, which are enzymes that are being put outside of the cell, um, and it is causing damage and increasing um, negative symptoms. It's contributing to pathogenicity and often therefore um, infection by that organism. When this is happening, um, you know, those are, yes, toxins. Those are exotoxins or exoenzymes. Examples of these would be streptokinase, streptolysin, 
um, elastase, collagenase, lipase, penicillinase. So for example, I guess the good, a good example would be penicillinase. Let's just look at that one. Um, this is an enzyme, an exoenzyme that breaks down um, penicillin. And that is one way that um, some uh, bacteria can be resistant to that drug. So that's just one example of the many of enzymes that uh, bacteria can make and a possible function for it. Okay, um, anytime we're deviating from normal conditions, whether it's the temperature or the pH, something like that, we can have our enzymes become chemically unstable. The term for this is labile. Denaturation is whenever we are breaking those hydrogen bonds, those weak bonds that are maintaining the structure, the overall structure of the protein and its shape. Um, that can uh, be achieved either through heat or the change in uh, pH, usually, usually significant change in pH. And even certain chemicals can cause this issue as well. Um, so now our enzymes shape uh, can't, doesn't have the correct active site anymore. We can't bind to the substrate and we can't um, act as the catalyst for that reaction to overcome um, that, uh, you know, activation energy block. So you get rid of that enzyme of cells and you're getting rid of the ability of the cell to be alive. Right, so a lot of the times metabolic pathways are going to occur in multi-step, right? There's just one step and then the whole cell is made. So there's a lot of steps involved, um, whether it is a step-by-step, -step, like this enzyme makes this small change and then the next enzyme makes the next small change and so on and so forth, depending on what reaction route you are going down for the cell. And intermediates can even go down different pathways. It's not like they're all just straight line and can't deviate from it, right? Which we'll talk about in a little bit. It's called... Um, amphibolism, but um, breaking down one thing, leading to the building of another thing, but that substrate, um, uh, that molecule that you just made that you built up can be used in this other reaction that can be broken down into this way to make blah, blah, blah. So that is the idea with that. Um, so they're all linked together, of course, and they can often um, interact with one another throughout the whole process. So a lot of times you can have a linear cycle where A goes to B to C to D, and that's all catalyzed by enzymes. We can even recreate our starting point when we have a reintroduction of certain aspects of molecules. So we can just cycle back through it, or we can branch off. It was just kind of like what I was talking about with all these different uh, byproducts that are made that don't have to necessarily, if we're looking at creating energy, ATP, which is what we're about to talk about. Um, if we're looking at creating energy, the, some of the products that are made in either in glycolysis or in the Krebs cycle, we can use those in other parts of the cell to make other molecules. And so it doesn't have to always go all the way through glycolysis or vice versa. Okay, competitive inhibition, um, controlling the direct action of the enzyme. So uh, um, anytime that you have uh, a molecule that mimics the substrate and also occupies, occupies that same active site where the substrate would be acted on, that's where we're going to have competitive inhibition. Um, then our inhibitor um, cannot be changed by the enzyme, so it blocks the action of the enzyme since it can't act on it, and but it can't change shape. Having said to say that it did act on it, then it gets stuck there, and we can't use that on substrates anymore. So that's how those competitive inhibitors work. They bind at the actual active site, whereas non-competitive inhibitors, what they do is bind at another site on the protein, different part of it completely, which we uh, would call the regulatory site or the allosteric site. And those regulators, they'll bind on that other part of the protein, um, even though the active site is um, not bound to anything, uh, when the regulator binds at that regulatory site, it causes a change in the shape of the protein so that it's now a different shape and can no longer interact properly with the substrate at the active site. The active site is no longer accessible in the same way to the substrate. So that is um, something where we could have, if the enzyme A is acting on uh, substrate A, and when it acts on it, it gives us product B, 
uh, product B can sometimes act as the regulator. So it lets as a negative feedback loop for production of molecules. So that helps us control that. So these are some pictures depicting that, um, showing us um, the active sites, uh, whereas the inhibitor, competitive inhibition, we're actually binding there, whereas non-competitive inhibition, we're binding somewhere else that causes a change in the shape of the protein so that the substrate can no longer bind. All right, next, um, suppressing enzymes. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know tell you, we can control it at the genetic level as well. It doesn't have to be at the actual enzyme level. So uh, the problem is, uh, so the, the response time will be longer than it would be for feedback inhibition, like what we were just talking about, but the effects are more enduring. So they last longer. So it's gonna have a longer effect. It depends on what you have going on with your enzyme and what's being made or broken down or whatever it is and how, as to how you might wanna regulate your enzyme. Do you want it done at the, at the site of the enzyme or do you wanna um, regulate it at the site of uh, the DNA? Because we can put um, inhibitors that block um, uh, RNA um, polymerase from acting at that promoter and making a uh, messenger RNA so that we can no longer copy that DNA into messenger RNA, right? Uh, and then therefore we won't have messenger RNA available to be read to uh, result in protein that functions to act on our substrate. So that's one way we can act on it. It's not always gonna only be on the enzyme itself. It can be genetically regulated. Um, okay. A lot of times uh, when we have induction of an enzyme, so repression or we're repressing an enzyme, that's one thing. We were just kind of talked about that. But if we're trying to induce an enzyme and kind of trigger the production of the enzyme by, you know, at the genetic level, um, it's often being induced by a substrate. And that will be kind of the opposite of what we just saw with the enzyme repression. So a substrate can come and bind at uh, protein that was blocking and cause it to disassociate from that site. And now we can go ahead and make that protein um, from that polymerase um, uh, promoter. Okay. When we are making energy in cells, we have a pairing essentially of exergonic and endergonic reactions. If you don't remember what these terms mean from chemistry, I will refresh your memory. Endergonic means it requires energy. You need ender into adding energy. That's all of that. Exergonic, exo, outside, um, putting out energy. So we are releasing energy there. So exergonic, we're going to be making energy available for work, making energy. Endergonic, we need energy like to build larger molecules. And a lot of times these are going to work together. Redox reactions are often important in um, metabolism. I'm telling you, they are important in metabolism. In any organism, um, that exchange of electrons, the electrons uh, essentially serve as a, a way of um, allowing us to get energy, make energy for the cells. So these always exist in pairs, the electron donor and the electron receptor. And this is where I would remind you guys of Leo says GER or oil rig, whatever works for you. But loss of electrons is oxidized, gain of electrons is reduced. Okay, so oxidoreductases are involved in that. And the important ones we want to remember for metabolism are NAD and FAD. So we could have, this is just salt, sodium chloride, but it's a good example of how the electron exchange can work. Um, this is due to uh, the formation of an ionic bond. Of course, we've already talked about ionic bond and ionization, right? So this should be a no-brainer. Here we have sodium. Um, it's got its little electron. And we've got chlorine that want doesn't have an, another electron. It has seven. It wants eight. And this wants to leave. So that we just have this happy eight in that orbital there. So this would be happier with eight. And it's outside um, for chlorine. So that's what they want, right? So... What's going to happen is, of course, sodium is going to give that electron to chlorine. And now we have its happy little eight. We got rid of the one that was just floating on the outside by its little lonesome. And then we have this happy little eight by, by adding another one to that seven. That's happy. And we know why it has this has a negative charge. We know why this has a positive charge. We get that because of that um, inequality now between the protons and the, and the uh, electrons. Fine. That's fine. 
But what's really going on here as far as a redox reaction, um, this guy lost an electron, right? So this was Leo, it was oxidized. This guy gained an electron, so it was reduced. So that's what our ending states are gonna be. But as far as how we got there, it's a little bit different, right? So the um, uh, reducing agent, the thing that is going to make the other atom be called reduced is called a reducing agent that will give up its electrons so that chlorine can be reduced. Chlorine, however, is going to accept electrons, therefore taking electrons from sodium. Sodium is now losing electron. So because chlorine is accepting that electron, it is oxidizing. It is an oxidizing agent to the sodium in this case. So an oxidizing agent causes the other molecule to be oxidized, okay? So that's one way you can look at it, or um, you can just try to remember the terms, <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, so NAD is one of our important electron carriers, extremely important in uh, creating energy for the cell. Uh, basically going to carry electrons in the form of a hydrogen atom. So we would have NAD, here is just NAD by itself. And when NAD binds with hydrogen, in the form of its electron here is its electron. Hydrogen with its electron here. We also have with it H plus because it's electron that was associated with it got put onto that guy, right? So that's what's going on here and why we would associate NADH with the H plus. So that electron is sitting there with the NAD, okay? That's what's really going on. NAD nicotinamide. Um, this is just the molecule that is involved in carrying around electrons in the um, in this whole uh, breaking down of glucose to make energy electron transport chain and everything. Cool. So that's how that works. Anytime you are coupling a uh, loss of electron with the gain of an electron, that's a redox reaction. Oxidoreductases are the enzymes that operate in that sort of situation. Um, we can use energy uh, associated with electron exchange and store it into um, uh, ATP by taking ADP and leading to uh, phosphorylation or adding of a phosphate on to ADP, adenosine diphosphate. Um, then uh, that would uh, add on another try. Tri I don't know what I'm saying that way. Uh, add on another phosphate. Um, group. So that now it is um, ATP. So the ATP is the one that carries the energy, the ADP less energy. So it's not quite as useful. Um, so that's why we want to add that phosphate group on and we can uh, couple that phosphorylation to redox reactions or electron exchange, essentially use the energy there to power it. That's called phosphorylation. Go figure whenever we do that. So that would be oxidative phosphorylation specifically because it's oxidative because we're moving electrons from one molecule to another. Um, da, da, da. Anytime we have transfer of um, removal of a hydrogen during a redox reaction, that's dehydrogenation. Okay, so when we're talking about NADH, um, carrying around that uh, electron in that hydrogen, um, later on, that's gonna give that up and lose it and go back to NAD. Well, that's dehydrogenation. Go figure. Um, a lot of, yeah. So there's a lot of steps that are going to be involved in um, electron transfer reactions. Um, a lot of this is going to be in the form of hydrogens and protons, which are going to necessarily be hydrogens without their electrons. So H plus, so hydrogen ions. It's important. Um, and it's going to be extremely important in the generation of energy here in a moment when we're talking about how energy is made for uh, cells, because um, those uh, hydrogen ions have that positive charge and they're going to have an effect on cells um, later on. We'll get to it. So NAD is our most common electron carrier. It carries a pair of electrons from dehydrogenation 
um, reaction. So other things were dehydrogenated. Now we're carrying around the hydrogen um, along with its H plus. Um, and then that's where the electrons have gone is into NAD. And then we have FAD and NADP um, that can be involved. Uh, FAD is involved in the electron transport chain, but NADP is involved in um, uh, photosynthesis. So catabolic actions or pathways. Catabolic pathways, we're breaking down molecules and we're going to use the energy that we got from breaking down those molecules and store them in, uh, in, into other energy-rich molecules that we can use elsewhere in the body. So uh, aerobic metabolism is talking about oxygen as our final electron acceptor whenever we are carrying around these electrons and putting them down uh, this little chain um, to drive the production of energy. Um, so aerobic metabolism requires oxygen at the end to deal with leftover electrons. And then anaerobic metabolism uses anything other than oxygen, basically. So we have adenosine triphosphate. This is ATP. This is our energy molecule. It consists of a nitrogenous base, adenine, a five carbon sugar ribose, and three phosphate groups that are bound to the ribose. Those phosphates do not want to be near each other. They're all negatively charged. And so they're really repelling one another and pushing hard like um, like south poles of a magnet would next to each other. So anytime we break off one of those phosphates, that's going to release energy that can be used by the cell to drive other reactions. That's essentially how ATP works as an energy source for the cell. Um, so anytime we use it, we have to replace it. So we're constantly needing ATP. Um, oh man, do we constantly need it? So we'll get into why. Um, of course, we, we think we know why, but I'm going to tell you real reasons why. Um, substrate, so we have to constantly be making it. We have oxidative phosphorylation, which we're about to get into. Then we have substrate level phosphorylation, where we have um, ATP being generated through transferring a phosphate group from one compound onto the ADP to make ATP. So oxidative phosphorylation, redox reactions, exchanging of electrons, whereas photophosphorylation, we are um, using light-driven reactions to make ATP. So um, basic idea with catabolic pathways, breaking things down to create energy. Aerobic respiration versus anaerobic respiration versus fermentation. They're all three quite different. All of them have glycolysis involved though. That is the way that we will break down the glucose. That's our starting molecule. To so start off um, you, in glycolysis, so you see here that, that we all have glycolysis, whether we are going through aerobic or anaerobic or fermentation. They all have glycolysis. Looks like when you look at fermentation, you essentially just go straight into um, our uh, uh, ATP production, and that's all the ATP that you get. You're not going to go through any extra steps. Um, so that creates a problem, of course. Uh, we have other organic compounds that will work as our final electron acceptors instead of oxygen or thing other than oxygen for anaerobic. Um, fermentation is an anaerobic means of creating ATP, usually used by facultative anaerobes. Um, they're not necessarily the favored or the primary way of making ATP, but it does work for these organisms. Aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration, depending on how, what organism we're talking about and you know, what we're using as our final electron acceptor, they can uh, both make pretty similar, up to, up to similar numbers of um, uh, ATP as a product of these reactions, which is quite impressive. Um, but aerobic respiration is by far um, much more successful, reliably compared to the other two. Okay, so the fermentation, this is just um, for facultative and certain aerotolerant anaerobes, the ones that can be in oxygen, but don't ever use it. Um, remember facultative anaerobes, these guys can use oxygen when it is available. Um, they'll go through aerobic respiration, but when it is not available, they'll undergo fermentation. We'll talk about that more in detail soon. Um, for aerobic respiration, we have um, enzyme catalyzed reactions that are going to be go happening all throughout all of these different steps and all these different pathways that we'll be following to get the generation of our um, energy. Um, and this is just mostly going to drive a uh, transfer of electrons from one thing to another or a collection of electrons throughout breaking down of molecules that will allow us to drive um, production of ATP via 
oxidative phosphorylation for the most part. Um, we do have some substrate level phosphorylation as well. So glucose is our starting compound going into glycolysis, glycolysis, um, glyco being sugar and uh, lysis being breaking it down. So that speaks for itself. So we're about to break down the glucose. It is a six carbon um, sugar. So there's a lot of bonds going on there that we can break down and we can just harness uh, the electron energy from those breaking down of uh, glucose molecules. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing. Um, essentially, we're going to be breaking down glucose, which is our six carbon molecule um, that also has a lot of, um, it's like C6H12O6 is its you know molecular formula. And um, we're about to break it down into carbon dioxide and water. And that's where all of it's going to go. And as we're breaking it down into just those simple things, we are, um, we're going to put in a little bit more oxygen as our electron acceptor. But the idea is um, we've, you know, released a ton of energy in breaking down that six carbon molecule, C6H12O6, uh, breaking that down into just CO2 and H2O um, releases a lot of energy we can put into making ATP. That's what I'm trying to say. So glucose, essentially, we're going to take a glucose sugar and we're going to break it into pyruvic acid through several steps. Um, and then we will also make ATP in the process. Um, that ATP is made anaerobically. That means we didn't need oxygen to get involved. We didn't need put, to put in any oxygen to make it happen. We have to have pyruvic acid because it's essential for going into the Krebs cycle in the next step. And that's where we want to go. So really glycolysis is just there to break down our six carbon glucose molecule into two, three carbon pyruvic acids. That's really what's going on there. So here we have up at top glucose. It's a six carbon molecule. I want you guys to focus more on the whole process than on these little things. And yes, we're going to phosphorylate it and have glucose six phosphate so we can break it down and interact with certain enzymes throughout this whole process. And that's nice. But you see, we're going to split up that six carbon molecule into essentially a three carbon molecule here. So this is glyceraldehyde three phosphate. This one is dihydroxyacetone phosphate, which is going to get turned into glyceraldehyde three phosphate, FYI. So basically make two of them. And then those two glyceraldehyde three phosphates are going to eventually become pyruvic acid through all these lovely steps that I'm not going to go through. And then that pyruvic acid is what we're going to send into uh, the Krebs cycle or into fermentation if we don't have any um, oxygen available. So that's where pretty much where we would stop for fermentation, right? So in uh, pyruvic acid, um, yeah, so strict aerobes like you and I and some anaerobes, um, we're going to send that pyruvic acid to the Krebs cycle. Other, other facultative anaerobes and such, they're going to be um, re-reducing pyruvic acid into other products, um, leading to the production of alcohol, like ethyl alcohol, ethanol, our drinking alcohol, um, or acids like lactic acid that we can use like for making pickled um, like kimchi and stuff like that. So that's the idea. All right, this is getting to the Krebs cycle. So we have our pyruvic acid. The first thing we're gonna do is convert it into acetyl-CoA. That's just what we're going to do to it. Um, within the Krebs cycle, we are going to have um, an oxidative reaction that releases CO2, and that's carbon dioxide. And that's whenever we start breaking off our, our carbons um, and start um, uh, harnessing basically the electrons while we're breaking uh, the molecules apart. So pyruvic acid from um, glycolysis, converting that into acetyl-CoA, pushing it into the Krebs cycle and oxidative reactions, um, oxidation reactions will um, cause the production of CO2 as a byproduct as we collect uh, the electrons in our electron carriers as we're pushing through everything. Very important step here, collecting those electrons via our electron carriers like nicotinamide. These guys are essential for um, driving metabolism here. So driving the next part, which is gonna be the electron transport chain essential for it. All right. In the Krebs cycle, um, well, this is going to happen twice for each glucose molecule, right? Because we got two pyruvic acids from the glu one glucose. So uh, we can go through the Krebs cycle 
twice thanks to that one glucose molecule. Um, and then we're going to be making our electron carriers carry some electrons for us. Uh, we're also going to make some ATP through substrate level phosphorylation. Again, when it is substrate level phosphorylation, that is not going to require the input of oxygen. So this is going to be, that's an anaerobic step as well. Okay, so um, right. The Krebs cycle has eight steps. Essentially, we're going from uh, one molecule to the next, to the next, to the next, being changed by all these enzymes in between. And that leads to um, electron transfer, essentially. And then we're going to be uh, generating carbon dioxide as a byproduct and um, creating our electron carriers that we're going to put through the electron transport chain in a moment. Um, yes, yeah, so I would be aware just of um, the general over, overall view of what's going on in the Krebs cycle, uh, what we're, we're making, what we're putting in, um, why we have those products putting in and why we have the products that are coming out and uh, you know where uh, how the how the ATP is being made through this process. So that's the idea of what I want you guys to get out of the Krebs cycle, but this is every step that's involved in it. They also call it the citric acid cycle because the first step is going to be um, making citric acid cool. All right, so the respiratory chain or the electron transport system or the electron transport chain, it is all the same. It is called the respiratory chain because you need oxygen in it. So what's going to happen is we're going to have our electron carriers, NADH and FADH2. We're going to get rid of those electrons. The electrons themselves are passed from one redox molecule to the next. So it's from molecule to molecule to molecule to molecule. As the electron passes through those molecules, we call them cytochromes. As we are passing our electrons through those molecules, those uh, that reaction will cause... Uh, hydrogen ions to get pushed outside of the cell, um, literally, or um, across the membrane if we're talking about the mitochondria where this happens in our cells. So anyways, um, at the end, we've pushed all these electrons through all these cytochromes. What happens to the electron at the end? Well, it has to go somewhere, right? Uh, it can't just like sit in, the, sit in the air or disappear into the ether out of nothing. So we do have to do something with it. So that's where oxygen comes into play. So here is the process that is involved in a bacterial membrane. We can see our cell wall out here just to give a visual. But basically as we are moving our electron from like NADH, now we've made protons, positively charged protons. And as we're moving our electrons through these cytochromes, we are pushing these H pluses, these protons, these hydrogen ions out of the cell out of the cytoplasmic membrane into this, what they call the periplasmic space, this between the cytoplasmic membrane and the cell wall, okay? So we're pushing out these hydrogen ions there, but now we have created something called the proton motive force. There are too many protons, okay? Too many positive outside. So what wants to happen is they wanna come back in, but they just keep getting, getting pushed across because the movement of those electrons and that's how it's, what's driving that. We have an enzyme called ATP synthase. That's the only way that those hydrogens can come back into the cell to equal things out because diffusion, right? We remember that things want to go from high concentration to low concentration. So we're going to equal things out. So that as those protons come in through that ATP synthase, it causes a change in the shape of that protein that allows for phosphorylation of ADP into ATP as a product. That happens to allow us to make quite a lot of um, ATP energy as a result of this. And um, yeah, so we get we get a lot, a lot made um, from the, that whole process. Uh, that's oxidative phosphorylation because we have that movement of the electron through all of those guys. This is what it looks like on the um, mitochondria. This is essentially going to be happening on the membrane folds inside of mitochondria called the cristae. That's what happens in your cells and my cells. So that ATP synthase is going to allow us to capture that energy from that electron um, carrier system uh, via that proton motive force that was made. Oxidative phosphorylation is what's going to allow for the production of ATP from ADP. 
as we have moved our electrons down through all those steps. So chemiosmosis is the term that is referring to the shuttling of electrons and uh, the hydrogen ions um, in tandem, um, moving all of those guys through or out of the cell, um, and then creating that proton motive force, that positive um, you know, gradient outside of the cell so that they want to move in through ATP synthase and drive the phosphorylation of uh, ADP into ATP. So that's the idea of how all of that works. Um, and all of that uh, separation of charges is what will store potential energy. And that's kind of what is driving the movement of these molecules, as well as um, creation of that proton motive force, right? That we can use um, by having those hydrogen ions come back in through the ATP synthase. Um, and it's the same for eukaryotes, really. It's just we have to deal with the uh, mitochondria and the membranes of the mitochondria. So we lose ATP um, a little bit, just a couple of, of ATP in that production due to that, dealing with that membrane. Um, so yeah, so we have uh, 36 to 38 ATPs that are going to be made from this whole entire process in aerobic respiration, starting with glycolysis, where we had our glucose. We um, uh, broke it down, our six carbon glucose into two, three carbon pyruvates, right? Then we went from our uh, pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. Then acetyl-CoA is pushed into the Krebs cycle where we are going to uh, break it down to release um, CO2 as a byproduct. And in that process, as we're breaking it down into CO2, we are also transferring electrons to NAD and FAD to make NADH and FADH2 um, to be shuttled to the electron um, carrier system. So then we go to that, we go to the electron transport system and we will um, release our electrons to move across all those cytochromes that are there, those little protein blobs. And um, yeah, we're gonna uh, push hydrogens out of the cell, create that gradient, let them come in through ATP synthase, that drives the changes in ATP synthase that allows for us to put a phosphate group onto ADP, making it into our energy molecule ATP. That's the summary. Um, I don't really need you guys to know the exact numbers in every single part of this, okay? What we are learning here, what I want you to get out of this, whether it is that we have uh, carbon dioxide or we needed water or whatever it is, um, actually, let's go into that terminal step. Let's start talking about the end and what we needed to have, why we needed to have oxygen. I keep telling you that it's the final electron character, a carrier, uh, acceptor. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor in aerobic respiration. Why? What does it mean? What does that mean? So no worries. I'm going to explain it to you. That's having to deal with our terminal step, our very, very last step in um, aerobic respiration. We've moved all of our electrons down the chain, um, pumped the hydrogens out. Now they're coming back in through the ATP synthase. What happens to those electrons? Because now we have to move more through to keep making ATP. You can't stop making it. Cannot stop making it, no joke. So you're never done, literally. So you're never done making ATP. Um, so what we need to do is get rid of those electrons. And what we do is, Take those little hydrogen ions that are coming back in through ATP synthase to um, help kind of maintain that proton motive force because we don't want them to equal out. Even though they keep trying to equal out outside and inside, we don't want them to equal out outside and inside because we want this to keep going. So what we do is we get rid of those some of those hydrogens that come in too. So we take those two hydrogen ions at H pluses and we have two of the electrons that we had shuttled through. And we take half of an oxygen that we have breathed in and that yields H2O as our product. We have taken care of our excess electrons. We have taken care of excess um, hydrogen ions, and we needed oxygen in order to do that, giving off water as a byproduct. This whole thing, which I just explained to you where carbon dioxide was made, right? That's gonna be the breakdown of um, pyruvate, pyruvic acid into um, carbon dioxide releasing electrons that are you know, shuttled by the electron carriers. So that's important, right? So that's why we exhale carbon dioxide. It's a separate, whole separate step from why we inhale oxygen. The oxygen in carbon dioxide, in case you haven't figured this out, CO2 in the carbon dioxide doesn't have anything to do with the O2 that you breathed in. 
at all. Sorry, <laughs> they're not related to one another. So they come from different places and different steps, which is so cool, right? If I smother you with a pillow right now and can't you can't breathe anymore and then you die, um, that's because you're not making ATP anymore because you're not able to deal with that, um, the final electron acceptor. You don't have your final electron acceptor. You don't have oxygen. So you have to just halt all ATP production. That's how much you need ATP. That's how quickly your body will react to not having enough ATP. That's so cool though, right? All right, fermentation is just another way to make ATP whenever we don't have oxygen available. Again, facultative anaerobes and aerotolerant anaerobes. This yields only a very small amount of ATP, only a couple of ATP overall for fermentation. Um, that is going to just go through glycolysis, break it into those two pyruvic acid molecules, three carbon pyruvic acids. And then we are going to essentially uh, turn those into drinking alcohol, ethanol, or um, lactic acid. So that's the idea of where that's going to be going. And our electron transfer is still going to be involving NAD, but it's just not going to be involving uh, having oxygen um, as our electron acceptor going through Krebs or anything like that. So this is going to make a minimal amount of ATP, but this is how we get drinking alcohol. And it is how, you know, we have lactic acid production that's going to lead uh, to pickling and stuff like that. Um, also yogurt and all of that. So products of alcoholic fermentation, uh, yeast we can use. Um, so we have pyruvic acid being converted to ethanol. Uh, we will decarboxylate that pyruvic acid to acid aldehyde. Um, so removing a CO2 from it, um, that will lead to production of ethanol when we reduce it. And then, um, NADH will be formed. Um, and then we will, um, so it's oxidized. Um, at this point, so we had formed an ADH. Now we're going to oxidize it um, and then generating NAD, which can go back to uh, glycolysis. We do need that in glycolysis to um, drive that reaction. So that is uh, what's going to be going on kind of at the, the smaller level of all of this. So homolactic fermentation, that's just going to create a lactic acid um, from the pyruvic acid. Then we have heterolactic fermentation. There we're going to be making uh, maybe a mixture of lactic acid, um, acetic acid, and you will have uh, carbon dioxide as a result of breaking down that glucose through fermentation. Mixed acid fermentation, that's something that um, the enterobacteriaceae and uh, bacteria will undergo. They have enzymes that allow uh, for production of a whole lot of enzyme, a whole lot of acids, um, from pyruvic acid all at the same time, essentially simultaneously. So uh, acetic acid, lactic acid, succinic acid, formic acid, as well as a carbon dioxide byproduct, that's mixed acid fermentation. It is different than heterolactic fermentation. It's not necessarily the same thing. All right. So this can lead to buildup of gas in um, intestines whenever fermentation is going on in your intestines. So this is where gas comes from. Lipid catabolism, the lipases, these are like kind of what they sound like. So lipid um, enzymes, uh, lipids being broken down by enzymes or lipases. Uh, we can enter into glycolysis um, with uh, byproducts that can be made from that and beta oxidation, which is oxidation of just fatty acids in general. So there's a whole lot of carbons that are available there um, and uh, creating um the uh, byproducts uh, that can enter into um, the Krebs cycle uh, as intermediates and all, all that. So anyways, basic, basic concept is if you've got a six carbon fatty acid, you can get 50 ATP, whereas one carbon, um, one six carbon sugar like glucose leads to 38 ATP. So you get a lot more ATP out of um, like a fatty acid, but um you know, there's more, there's more to it than just that. It's not as simple as that. All right. Proteases here, we're going to be breaking down proteins into their constituents. So that's going to be amino acids, right? Amino groups can be removed um, from D via deamination. So literal D amine, removing the amine groups. That's the NH2 groups. And then we can enter into the Krebs cycle with certain um, various intermediates 
um, and participate in Krebs cycle to make energy from there. So that would be utilizing protein as a source of energy. Amphibolism is just referring to uh, joining uh, catabolism and anabolism together uh, to work together um, to like the energy from catabolism and breaking bonds and then storing it in the form of ATP and using that to drive um, building together larger molecules in anabolism. So that's amphibolism. We have catabolism and anabolism working together. Um, so a lot of these uh, precursors that we have going on in glycolysis and or Krebs cycle, we can use those to build other molecules in the cell. That's the idea with this. So, uh, and then, all right. Pyruvate um, can be an um, intermediate for certain amino acids, building those. There's also something called gluconeogenesis, where we can use pyruvate as a starting point for glucose synthesis, so actually making glucose from the pyruvate um, in the event that we don't have enough glucose uh, in, available in like our diet. Then we have acetyl-CoA that can be converted into um, you know, acids and used to make um, lipids even and the proteins and lipids from acetyl-CoA if we have an excess of that and we don't need quite as much ATP. So we're always, always kind of working on that. So uh, precursors to DNA and RNA, uh, we can get that from certain intermediates um, in the Krebs cycle as well. So it's just showing where we would get that from. Um, biosynthesis, um, several alternative pathways. Uh, we're talking about um, building up all sorts of store, storing up our molecules, not necessarily using them right away to make ATP, but storing them up in our body to be used later on um, that could be forming like a glycogen, for example. So that's one way we can store the um, energy. Plants can store it in the form of cellulose cell walls, right? As well as storage granules to literally hold on to um, these molecules for a rainy day. Um, we know proteins are essential as far as um, building up, you know, we're working as enzymes in the cell to drive a lot of these reactions. So, of course, we need the products to make amino acids, to make proteins, and all of that. So, duh, we need that. So, we need to be able to make that. We can do that from a lot of the um, intermediates in these pathways. When we're growing a cell, we're making a new cell, you know, two cells, if you're going from one to two cells, two cells need twice as many ribosomes, twice as many enzymes, et cetera, et cetera. You need to have the copy. They each need to be functional. So you have to build all of this stuff. So putting all of this stuff together to make an entire cell, whether we are making those proteins we were talking about, whether we are uh, making um, the lipids, that we are going to need to make new membrane or for um, needing enzymes to um, you know oh, help us build these molecules or put these things together or even break things apart and whatever you need a whole lot of energy that's going to go into making a new cell that requires atp and that requires the um, formation of atp it also requires the formation of these molecules that are going to be necessary for building up the cell in all of its parts so that is uh, quite a large picture way of um, assessing all of this, but it does all happen um, simultaneously, essentially. So making the energy to drive uh, building up these larger molecules, make new cells, constantly doing this. So uh, um, sort of complementary to this, we have uh, photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is kind of what it sounds like, using um, the sun, photo, using light, uh, to drive the synthesis of energy in a way, or carbon molecules, so uh, organic carbon molecules, are light-dependent reactions. These are only going to occur in the actual sunlight. They cannot occur when the sun goes down. These are the, our catabolic reactions, so our energy-producing reactions. Um, then we have the light-independent reactions. Um, this is going to be um, stuff that happens like overnight while the sun isn't out. And these are anabolic. So they were, here we're synthesizing um, new molecules. So carbon dioxide carbons are going to be added uh, together um, to create organic molecules like glucose. So the way that this is done, essentially um, we have the light activating some pigments that are going to work similarly to the electron transport chain. 
we have excitement of uh, molecules, and then those are going excited molecules are going to lead to pumping the hydrogen ions uh, into the uh, inner chamber in the chloroplast. And then um, that's going to create a gradient that allows uh, ATP synthase, again, same thing, to phosphorylate ADP into ATP. And I don't want to make a ton of ATP, but you're making enough that will allow you to drive the production of a uh, glucose or other organic carbon-based molecules um, in the dark reactions in the Calvin cycle. So this is just a breakdown of what's going on and all these different um, you know, photosystems that are involved in photosynthesis. I don't need you to know this, but just be aware of the general concept of photosynthesis and how it, it works in the big picture. So those light independent reactions, we have made some ATP from the light. So now we go into the independent reaction, light independent reaction. Um, this is going to happen in these actual cytoplasm of cyanobacteria, so the photosynthetic bacteria, or in the stroma of the chloroplast of eukaryotes. So they're going to use that ATP that we made from the light to make glucose. Now, why do they need glucose? Well, they need to have glucose or something else very important that uh, we just talked about. I'll let you guys think about that one for just a second. Why would plants need glucose other than, you know, building their structures of their cells or something? They have to drive aerobic respiration. Most of their energy is going to come from that too. So they have to have glucose to drive that, to, to put everything through the mitochondria um, or, you know, energy making process for the cell to make enough ATP to drive, you know, building new building blocks or whatever. So they still have to go through that. That's not something that doesn't happen in plants. So photosynthesis can be oxygenic or anoxygenic, basically making oxygen as a byproduct. Um, this is the most dominant form of photosynthesis on the planet. That's going to be plants, algae, and cyanobacteria. Um, the algae and um, cyanobacteria together are going to create most of the oxygen in our atmosphere. Then we have anoxygenic photosynthesis. This is going to be uh, green and purple bacteria. They have a different kind of pigment, essentially, and only one photosystem, whatever. Um, they have make a, just a small amount of ATP, but they don't create any oxygen as a byproduct. Most of these guys are going to be strict anaerobes. So at the end of this chapter, my question to you guys is why do plants need to synthesize glucose, which I just said, and that's fine. But um, if you guys don't understand what I was talking about with the answer to that question, please work through it and try to figure it out on your own at this point, because you do need to understand that um, plants don't just undergo photosynthesis, it's not magic. All right, uh, that's that for this chapter. Chapter 10 is done. Uh, one of my favorite chapters too, so I hate to see it go. And I'll see you guys for the next one.